بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Many amongst the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa taala, from time to time, they have issues that keep them up at night, stress them from work, stress from family life, stress from other issues in life. And these things, if they do not stress you in relationship to you yourself, then it is stress pertaining to your children, or it is stress pertaining to a close relative, or it is something which saddens you from news that you have heard that has happened in the ummah which saddens you. So there are many reasons why people become sad in life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in many places, for example in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوءِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And we are going to test you in such ways that you will have loss of life, you will have loss of wealth, and you will feel hunger and other things and glad tidings to those who are patient. So being tested in life is something which has to happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from time to time will test us to see how we behave. Some people in regards to these tests, when times become difficult and times become hard, they look for way out, the way out in the wrong way. They turn to complaining. They turn to whining, they turn to intoxicants, they turn to things other than that. And some of them go as far as harming themselves. But alhamdulillah, in Islam, Allah Azawajal has given solution after solution after solution for our problems. And from the greatest of these solutions is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which he has given us. Which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us promise to answer our du'as if we call upon him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And nobody should doubt in the promises of Allah Azza wa Jal because He says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَنْ أَسْتَقُوا مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلًا And who is more truthful than Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala in speech? So if Allah Azza wa Jal promises you that He will answer your du'as, then you should have full faith in that issue. Because if you don't have full faith in the promise of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have to check your iman. If you doubt in the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer, the needs and the calls of his creation, after having promised it in the Quran and the Sunnah, then you must have something wrong with your faith. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ عُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord says, commands you, call upon me, I will answer you. Call upon me, I will answer you. So look here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his mercy, not only does he encourage you to call upon him, but rather he gives you the command. And this is so different. It shows you the magnificence and the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu unlike the sons of Adam, he likes to give. But the son of Adam, when you ask him for something, he becomes upset with you. Time after time you keep asking him. He changes his phone number. He doesn't want to hear from you anymore. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the complete opposite. Allah subhanahu is upset with you if you do not call upon him. Why is this the case? That Allah Azawajal loves to give, but the son of Adam, when you call upon him, becomes upset. Why is this the case? Selfish, the son of Adam is selfish and poor. In reality, the son of Adam has nothing to give. And he knows that deep down. He may walk around on the earth feeling proud and arrogant from what he possesses, but he knows his reality, that in reality he's poor. If he gives something and Allah doesn't replace that for him, he is poor. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about himself, Ya ayyuhan nas, antum al fuqara'u ila Allah, wallahu huwa al ghaniyul hamid. Allah tells us the reality that, O oh mankind, it is you that are in need and poverty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely rich and free of all needs. So that's the reality. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He encourages us to call upon Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to call upon the creation. Because the creation, as we mentioned, cannot give. And from the beauty of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah teaches us that when you call upon Him, your private conversation with Allah goes directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no intermediary between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not like in other religions, when they have a need, they have to go and speak to a priest. When they have the need, they have to go to a particular temple or a particular place 
or wait for a particular season from the seasons of the year. But you as a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any time you have a need, Allah encourages you to call upon him directly and he answers directly. Allah says, and if they ask you, O Muhammad, concerning me, tell them that I am close to them. And I answer the call of the one who calls upon me when he calls. Allah is close to you. There's no need for an intermediary. So in this verse, which is often used as a proof that when you make dua, you shouldn't have an intermediary between you and Allah. And when my slaves ask you, O Muhammad, concerning me, then verily I am close. Elsewhere in the Quran, in many places, when the Prophet Muhammad was asked about something, Allah Azza wa Jal would instruct him to say, Qul, yas'alunaka anil ahilla, Qul, yas'alunaka mada yunfiqoon, Qul, yas'alunaka anil khamr, Qul. Every time they would ask Muhammad, Sallallahu alayhi wasallam something Allah azza wa jal will command him to say say such and such but in this verse that we mentioned wa idha sa'alaka ibadi anni fa inni qareeb there's no qul if my slaves ask about me then i am close he didn't say say i am close so Allah azza wa jal took the intermediary who is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam away so your dua is direct to Allah azza wa jal there's nothing between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you call upon him and this is something beautiful which is gifted to the believers that we don't need any intermediary between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua, as we are taught in the Quran and the Sunnah, Dua is a relationship that we have with Allah Jal, which is a relationship of closeness and nearness, a special relationship that you have with Allah Jal. For example, we mentioned the verse just now, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ إِبَادِ anni fa inni qareeb. If my slaves ask about you, O Muhammad, talking about in the context of calling upon Allah, making dua, then I'm close. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, which is narrated by Imam Ahmed and Sahih Muslim, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدُ فَأَكْثِرُ الدُّعَى The closest that a slave is to his Lord is when he is prostrating. So increase in that position in making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whenever you're making dua to Allah subhanahu what is happening in your relationship? You are having this close proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A special time, a special conversation. So how should you feel when you have this? The one who spends often his time seeking Allah azawajal, seeking Allah azawajal to answer his call, complaining to Allah instead of complaining to the creation who in fact can do nothing. It's a waste of time complaining to the creation. Complain to Allah azawajal. He loves to hear your complaint. The creation, they don't want to hear your complaint. In reality, they can't answer your complaint anyway. So be in the habit of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you do this, then you are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he has mentioned. So this brings about joy. The Prophet sallallahu and the Quran teaches us that when you make this dua, you are fulfilling one of the best acts of worship and the most beloved acts of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith in Tirmidhi, al-du'a huwa al-ibadah. Dua is the essence of worship. Dua is what? It is the foundation and essence of worship. When you make dua to Allah, you are doing the best of acts of worship. And this again shows you the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does it show you the mercy of Allah knowing that dua is from the best of worship or the essence of worship? Because who creates for you the need to call upon Allah? It is Allah. You go through life, you have difficulties. So we, when we're weak in Iman, we are people of complaint. Oh Allah, why me? Why are you doing this to me for? Why am I being tested this way? But if you look at it as the righteous look upon it, they say, SubhanAllah, this is a reason for me to call upon Allah. This is a reason now for me to get close to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is giving me, giving me this tribulation and this difficulty because He wants me to come back to Him. He wants me to be close to him. That's how the righteous look upon this. And this is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality. That he slaps us from time to time to wake us up. Because we drift astray from Allah azawajal. We carry on with our shahawat, our desires. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings you back to him. Time after time giving you some difficulty. So this is a mercy from Allah azawajal that he has made not only this act of worship 
the essence of worship and be loved to him but he gives you cause after cause to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you make dua to Allah azawajal, you should have so much hope and you should know that this is a win-win situation when you call upon Allah azawajal. the one calling upon Allah azawajal in dua never loses out in reward or in having their duas answered Salman al-Farsi radiyallahu anhu mentions in the hadith collected by Imam Tirmidhi where he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى حَيِّيٌّ كَرِيمٌ يَسْتَحِي إِذَا رَفَعَ رَجُلْ يَدَيْهِ إِلَيْهِ أَنْ يَرُدَّهُمَا سِفْرًا خَائِبَتَيْنِ He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bashful, shy, and so generous that he is shy that when the person raises his hands to him making dua to return his hands empty-handed empty and without benefit this is your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala that when you call upon Allah azawajal, he becomes shy in a way which befits him we cannot translate the word correctly حييون, but the close translation inshallah as I asked Shaykh Hazim he said maybe shy and bashful so Allah azawajal, in a way which befits his majesty and in a way which is perfect to him has this feeling when you call upon him subhanahu wa ta'ala so we should call upon Allah Azawajal regularly. We should be shy not to be calling upon Allah Azawajal, knowing that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala answers our du'as in the way that He has mentioned. But of course, it's imperative to remember that when we call upon Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, as I mentioned, this is a special relationship, right? And you are calling upon somebody. You are calling upon the Creator of the heavens and the earth. You are calling upon the true Majesty of the universe. So when you go and you enter upon somebody at work who is important or you enter upon a dignitary you don't just enter in any way shape or form you speak to that person in a particular manner in fact let's be honest we grovel to the person anybody we want something from we kind of grovel to them we kind of speak to them in a very meek manner and we choose words which we know are going to please that person so we hope that we can get what we need from that person that is the reality of all of us whether you admit it or not when you speak to somebody of importance and you need something from them, you will grovel. So how about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How is it that many a time people, they call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they don't establish the mannerisms of making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? From the first of these mannerisms and the most important is that you should have sincerity when calling upon Allah azza wa jal. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ Okay? They were not commanded except to worship Allah Azawajal, except with sincerity, making everything for His pleasure alone. So don't be like those people who sometimes, in front of other people, they start to make a longer dua. They start to make their voice louder. They start to beautify their dua because they want other people to know that look at the special words that I know that I call upon my Lord with. No, you're wasting your time doing that. Keep your dua between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People can't give you anything. We have to remind ourselves time after time. It is only Allah Azawajal who can give us. So it's Him that we have to be sincere to, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's Him that we are trying to impress. And as we said, when you enter upon somebody, you don't enter into the conversation directly, right? It's praise after praise that you give to that person. And then you start asking your needs to that person. Likewise, this has to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu mentioned in the hadith in Tirmidhi, where he said, إِذَا صَلَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَبْدَى بِتَحْمِيدِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَثَنَاءَ عَلَيْهِ ثُمَّ لَا يُصَلِّ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ مُحَمَّدِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَدْعُ بَعْدُ بِمَا شَاءَ The Prophet ﷺ gave advice to one of the companions. He said, when you make dua to Allah Azawajal, start by praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Glorify Allah, praise Allah, mention the names and attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and make thana upon Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, a praise. And then make salah upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then call upon Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for whatever you need. So don't make it an issue when you make dua straight away. Ba, 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 ba. No. Beautify your dua. Beautify this special conversation that you're having with Allah. Mention Allah's names and attributes. Ponder upon the greatness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Implore Allah Azza wa with these names and these attributes. And then make salah upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then go ahead and pour out your heart to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala asking him what you need. So we mentioned uh, that you have to make salah upon Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he further established this or further um, 
brings home this point as mentioned in the hadith in Tirmidhi where he said, Inna dua mawquf bayna samai wal ard la yas'ad minhu shay hatta tusalli ala nabika Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, verily the dua that you make, it hovers between the earth and the skies. It doesn't go up until what? Until you make salah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is from the greatest of the keys of having your dua answered, is to make salah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are different places when you make your dua or different ways places in the dua that you can make salah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa What is the first of them? In the beginning is the first of them, right? That's the first way as mentioned by Imam Ibn Qayyim. What's the second way you mentioned it? At the end, beginning and the end. What's the third way? In the middle as well, ahsant. So in the beginning, the middle and the end. So you have all three ways. But of course, after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So all ways are permissible. In the beginning, after praising Allah, in the beginning and the middle, or in the beginning, sorry, in the beginning and the end, beginning, middle and end. Tayyip, what about if you are in sujood? Should you use the same seerah, the same methodology? You praise Allah azawajal, you make salah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whilst being in sujood. Can you do that? Many of the ulama, like Sheikh Ibn Baz rahimullah ta'ala and others, they allowed it. They said, yes, even in the situation of being a sujood, go ahead and do this because this will be helpful for, to you in having your dua answered. So in sujood, knowing that you are close to Allah azawajal, praise him subhanahu wa ta'ala with tasbih and other uh, dhikr and then make salah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then make your dua to Allah azawajal. When you make the dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should be decisive. You should be decisive when you make this dua. Who told us this? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In Bukhari Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَا يَقُولَنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَلَّهُمَ أَغْفِلْ لِي إِنْ شِئْتْ أَلَّهُمَ أَرْحَمْنِي إِنْ شِئْتْ لِيَعْزَمَ لَا الْمَسَلَةَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا مُكْرِهَ لَهُ That none of you, when you are calling upon Allah, should say, Oh Allah, forgive me if you wish. If you wish. Oh Allah, have mercy upon me if you wish. No, rather, you should be affirmative in calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be decisive, for there is none that can compel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, be decisive when you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, the ulama, they teach us that when you make dua, be persistent. Make ilha. Ilha is to ask time after time after time. Don't give up thinking that Allah azawajal is not answering my dua. Rather, Imam Ibn Qayyim in Jawab al-Kafi, he said this is from the best of medicines. From the best of medicines is to make ilha in dua, that you go and you keep asking the same dua time after time after time. You know, sometimes you read in the seerah and in, or you speak to somebody righteous and you find something out, which is that the righteous people, when they make dua, to them, the dua is more sweet to them and more beloved than actually having it answered. SubhanAllah. We, me and you, we want to be answered right now. We don't have the patience. We want to be answered now. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these people, they make dua and they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to hear their voice. Maybe that's why Allah is making ta'khir in the ijabah. Allah azawajal is not answering their dua because Allah loves to hear them imploring with him with such sincerity. They know this. And they enjoy this conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we shouldn't be those people who become despondent if our dua has not been answered straight away. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to hear your voice. Maybe he loves to hear you imploring him. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to answer your dua, but rather he's going to give you something which is better. Because you are just insan. You are just a simple miskin person. Your brain doesn't work as well as you think it does. So you're asking for something thinking this is good for me, but Allah subhanahu wa is delaying that because he's going to give you something which is even better. Or well, what is another situation? Why doesn't Allah answer the dua? What else would happen in the situation if Allah is not answering your dua apart from what I've mentioned? It might not be good for you. Or you might be saving it for you later. Saving it for you later in the akhir, okay? Or, or Allah will remove something from you which is equal to the dua in terms of harm. But sins are forgiven anyway because it's a good deed when you are calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zakallah khair. So these are some of the issues. Extremely important when we have these mannerisms of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we have presence of heart and mind. Many a time you see people, especially in Jummah, look tomorrow when you are praying, 
In fact, don't look because you will be doing the same thing that I'm telling you not to do then. When you are making dua, concentrate upon what you are saying. Think who you are calling upon. Don't just make it an action of the tongue. But you see people in Jummah, they're making dua like this and they're just looking around at everybody else making dua. Where is your connection to Allah in that dua? Where is your humility? Where is your poverty? Where is your concentration on the words? Where is your true begging of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer my dua if I'm looking around everywhere else? So the dua shouldn't be just made by the tongue. It should be made by the heart and the mind. And this is what the Prophet said in the hadith mentioned by Imam Tirmidhi. Call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whilst being fully convinced that Allah will answer your dua. And know for sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not answer the dua from a heart which is heedless and unaware. So going back to my point, when we make the dua, you have to be concentrating. You have to be thinking about what you are saying and you have to have deep conviction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer the dua. An important etiquette also is that when we make the dua, we raise our hands in making dua. This is the asal, right? As we mentioned in the hadith, Allah is shy to return the hands empty-handed. But where do you raise your hands to? Depends upon a situation, okay? If the dua is a general dua, then the dua is raised up to the uh, shoulder, like so, like normal. But if the dua is a dua where you are trying to beg Allah to remove a calamity from the ummah or something of serious nature, then you raise your hands to a position where the Prophet would do so until his armpits would show. Okay, you raise your hands up high in that position. When would you not raise your hands in dua? You're making dua, don't say in sajood, I know your hands are on the floor in sajood. When would you not raise your hands in, in, in dua? In congregation, if the imam is making dua in congregation, no, if he raises his hands in congregation, you can do so also. If he doesn't. If he doesn't, ahsant. And that's what I was looking for. In Jummah, when? When the, when the Imam is on the member and he's giving the khutbah. If the Imam doesn't raise his hands in this situation, then you don't. In fact, it's narrated by Abi Dawood and Isah al Muslim that one of the companions, he saw one of the ministers, one of the governors on the member, Yom al Jummah. Khutbah, making dua with his hands raised. So he said, He said, May Allah disgrace these two hands. He said, For sure I saw the Prophet doing the dua on the member and he didn't do more than pointing with his, uh, this finger, what's it called, index finger? who's this index finger, okay, whilst making the dua. So this is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that whilst making dua on the member, you point with your finger, okay? But what if you see somebody doing dua, raising their hands? Don't make inkar upon them. Don't be harsh with them because many people, they don't know this sunnah. And number two, there is some difference of opinion. So if we see people raising their hands, don't make inkar upon them. Don't be harsh with them. But if you know them, then you can teach them that in the hadith in Abi Dawood and Sahih Muslim, the companions, they would look down upon raising of the hands on the member. On the member now, the imam is on the member. When should he raise his hands? Huh? Ahsant, dua al-istisqa, when you are making dua for the rain. In that position, in that time, you should raise your hands for making uh, dua for the rain, okay? And then the etika, an important one, inshallah, we'll come to end soon. We shouldn't be like that person, that friend that you have. He only remembers you when he has a need. Everybody has experienced somebody like that, right? Not that it bothers us, inshallah, we're generous people. It doesn't matter if somebody keeps in touch or not. But he only calls you after such a long time when he has a need. If a person continues to behave in that manner, you start to feel a bit distant from that person. And I'm not saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way, shape or form has this relationship with his slaves because Allah's generosity is beyond what we can imagine, right? Allah loves that you turn to him and call upon him even if you haven't done so for 20, 30 years. But for us, this is a really bad mannerism. This is something that we should avoid. You only call Allah when you have a need. Is this your relationship in dua with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where is you calling upon Allah to say, Oh Allah, Grant me the ability to thank you for the beautiful things that you have given me in life. 
Where are you calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ask for itbat, to ask for firmness in iman? Even though everything is going good for you, and well for you, still you should be calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't only call upon Allah azawajal when things are difficult. The Prophet sallallahu mentioned the hadith in Tirmidhi, where he said, Man sarrahu an yastajib Allahu lahu in the shada'idi wal karb, fal yukthir dua fil rakha. Whoever pleases him, that Allah Azawajal will answer his du'as when things become difficult, then ensure that he calls upon Allah Azawajal when he is in a state of ease. Do this when you're in a state of ease, ensure that you are calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as often as you can. The last thing that I will finish with, and there are many more items, but as an introduction and as a reminder for us, so we can go home and listen to other lectures on this topic, that one of the most important things for you to make your du'a pleasing and more acceptable to Allah Azawajal is to strengthen your du'a. How do you strengthen your du'a apart from the things that I mentioned? By begging and crying. By making ilha, begging and crying. We mentioned this. What else? Of course, a state of humility. That's the state of the heart. Very good. We mentioned something like this. What else? Something very important. Asma wa sifat. We mentioned also calling upon Allah Azawajal, thinking about what you were saying, but this is extremely important. Something Right times, which we didn't mention, which is extremely important to call upon particular times. Allah Azawajal, give me an example. Last of the night from the best of them. When it's raining, what else? Huh? After the Fard Salah and some ulama, they say before the Salah finishes in your the shahud. When else? Between the? Between the Adhan and the Iqama, when you are traveling. So there's so many opportunities Allah Azawajal gives where our dua can be strengthened. But that's not what I'm reaching for. I'm reaching for, think about the person who fires an arrow. There's two people. Sincerity we mentioned in the beginning. The strength of the arm of that person will uh, dictate how far the arrow goes, yeah? So the strength of your iman, the strength of your good deeds. The more good deeds you have, the closer your dua will be knocking on the, heaven, on the doors of the heavens, right? And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu when he mentioned the hadith of the person who was traveling and his hair was disheveled and he was hungry, and he raised his hands and he said, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb. But the Prophet ﷺ said, Anna yustajabalahu. How is his dua going to be answered? Ghudhiya min haram. He's being fed from haram. His clothing is from haram. His drink is from haram. So all of this weakened his dua and made his dua maybe invalidated. So the opposite of that, Mufum al Khalifa, is that the more strength you have in your dua through doing acts which please Allah, then your dua will be answered for you. And from the best ways of having your du'a answered, just to finish with, is that you make du'a for other people. The hadith mentions, Shaykh Abdul Aziz, can you remind me what the hadith is of the angel being muwakkal uh, ilayhi? When you make du'a, remember? So in the narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that when you make your du'a for your brother without him knowing, ala dhahr al ghayb without him knowing, then there is an angel appointed to you who says, Ameen, and for you also. So the angel ends up making dua for you, subhanAllah. Why? Because you made dua for another person. So many of the wise people, they say, if you want dua for you, yourself to be answered, make it for somebody else. So please, make those duas for me. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shortcomings, mistakes was from myself and shaitan. If you have any questions on the topic or corrections, feel free. May Allah subhanahu reward you all immensely. Ameen. Good point. So, um, in which language should you make dua? What do you think? Huh? Somebody said Arabic, your own language. No, it should be made in Arabic to the best of your ability and using the duas that you find in the Quran and the Sunnah. This is the best way to make the dua. If you cannot do in Arabic, then you can do in any language until you get to the point where you can do in Arabic. Okay? And some of the ulama that even allowed that to be in the sujood. Even when in the position of the sujood, that you can use a language other than Arabic. But this is a, a, minor, a minority opinion. Yeah? The majority, they say, no, you have to use Arabic.